Okay, fantastic. So let's get going. So this will be the last lecture with um, uh, these applications to look at people coming in and telling us about what they like the stuff they do within this topic. So it's a pleasure to have Henry Moss here, who is First and foremost, he's a fantastic cyclist. But what he also does when he doesn't ride bikes is that he does fatigue damage. And Henry did a math underground here in Cambridge and then went up to Lancaster, where there's much better cycling, I believe. Much better. Much better cycling. Uh, but also to do a PhD in statistical learning up there. And has since, for a couple of years, been working at the company Second Mind, which is doing a lot of active learning things uh, here in Cambridge. So, floor is all yours. Cool. Henry. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. So, yeah, I'm Henry. Um, so, I work at a company called Second Mind. Uh, and the idea is that we employ various machine learning bits and bobs to help design cars. This goes the Cheers. Um, so, we're a tech startup, pretty small, 50 people. Um, and we're perhaps more well known for our open source toolboxes than we are anything else. So you might have, if you're interested in gas and processes, um, you might have come across GP Flow, for example. Um, but the kind of the goal of the company is to develop software uh, to do active learning and Bayesian optimization. And um, so Carl Henrik assured me that you kind of know a bit about Bayesian optimization, um, but I'm going to kind of explain why a lot of the basics don't really work in real life uh, and what we've developed to, to make proper use of it. Um, and this is, yeah, some propaganda from the website. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, cool. So, but before I can get into anything kind of technical, I'm going to start talking about electric cars. So this is basically, I've said everything you wanted to know, but it's basically everything that I know, um, which may not be the same thing. Uh, there's the Tesla truck. Uh, oh, no battery. That's worrying. Right, is that not? Is that okay? Yeah, we're charging. Okay, good. Kind of ironic, really. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, okay, electric motors. Where were we? Right, so I've, this is the only interactive bit, but what year do you think the first electric car was made? This surprised me. A new kind of car. <laughs> uh, electric electric vehicle, so something that's powered by electricity and a battery. 1980s. 1980s. 90s. Before the 80s, 90s. <laughs> oh, you probably, maybe this is you, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but this is crazy. So there's this, there's this um, car, this is some French bloke, I can't remember his name. Uh, he built this car and then he also built a train that went between Edinburgh and Glasgow. And then the Scottish people got annoyed with it and broke it. And they smashed it up. But if you kind of look at this, it took me a week, kind of a, a while to work out what it is. But you've got one massive wheel on the left, and then oh, I've actually cut off the, the front of it. That's not helpful. But you've got two small wheels on the right. Um, so I really don't really understand how it works. But there's some sort of motor uh, pushing you along. Uh, we also had electric cars on the moon, and in fact they're still there. Um, so you can go see them. You can go see them if you want. Um, and this is kind of the first, <laughs> although failed, uh, production electric vehicle. So this is, oh, what's the, is it Clive? The Sinclair guy? Clive, yeah. I can remember it was Clive. Not. Um, so there he is. He doesn't look very happy, which is maybe why they shouldn't sell these. Um, but it could do about 20 miles at about 15 miles an hour. So it could do 250 watts. I guess if you're a cyclist, you know what that means, but it's not very much. So Carl could easily do 15 miles an hour for much further than 20 miles, I would have thought. maybe. 1,200, <laughs> um, but there was that. Um, and then you've got this kind of horrible looking thing, uh, 2010, um, that's it for that. Um, so the type of electric motor is you have some sort of energy source, a battery, uh, and you convert the electricity into something that spins. Um, and this is gonna be a very, very kind of high level rough picture of what's going on here. Um, hopefully demonstrative, but it's, uh, probably incorrect if you actually know quite a lot about this sort of thing, which I imagine some of you will. Um, but yeah, imagine you have a wheel that's got a magnet on it. So imagine now that there's some other magnets somewhere else. Oh, this is meant to spin. Doesn't look like it's gonna spin, oh well. Um, 
So if you imagine that you have these magnets here, and if you were going to move the two outer magnets round in a circle, the inner one would spin as well. And that's largely what's going on in an electric motor. Um, so this is a very simplistic sort of slice of one. Um, so we have this thing called a stator, which is this outside big circular bit with the, the kind of the, the rungs in it on the inside. Uh, and that stays in place. There's this internal thing, which is called the rotor, um, which is a circle bit in the middle, a cylinder in the middle, uh, and it has some magnets on the outside. Um, and then you pass a current through this, the stator on the outside, and that generates a, um, a magnetic field, which, which causes the, the inner bit to, to rotate. It's not really very exciting, but that's kind of the point. Um, there's very little going on in these electric motors, which is why they're kind of nice. Um, so I can compare one to, uh, this is an ice engine, so an internal combustion engine. Um, and that's all about like blowing stuff up to move things up and down. Um, and that moving up and down isn't very useful if you want to move something in a circle. So the entire point of all sort of internal combustion engines is how do you convert movement this way into movement that way? Uh, and it's they're typically highly ineffective. So like a, a typical car engine is like 95, oh, sorry, 30% uh, energy efficient, whereas you can get kind of 95% energy efficiency in an electric motor. So that's why people care about them. You get really funky designs in internal combustion engines now as well. So this is uh, one from Mazda. Um, and this is kind of just demonstrative of the lengths that people will go to, to convert the up and down into spinning. Um, but it's super complicated, this thing. So uh, there's loads of issues why you wouldn't necessarily want to, want to use it. Okay, so the goal of the electric motor, you want to produce torque. So I'm going to just kind of paint a little bit of a picture here of some kind of key quantities of interest. And um, so the torque itself depends on this current, which I described. So the current um, um, spins the internal, the internal um, magnets, and we control basically the current through two numbers. There's kind of the current itself, and then also the phase angle of the current. So this is kind of, you can think of this as the, the angle um, of, of, the, of, the, of the field. Um, so you have to have these two numbers uh, right uh, to, to be very efficient. If you get the, for example, the phase angle wrong, it means that you're going to waste a lot of energy uh, heating up uh, the motor. The crucial thing here is that actually the torque also depends on some environmental conditions, things like how fast the motor is, is spinning, um, how much voltage is coming from the battery. So like the longer you use the battery, uh, the voltage will drop, uh, and also the engine itself can raise in temperature. Um, so these are things that kind of confuse the picture a little bit. And so the project that I've been working on recently in Second Mind is something called electric motor calibration. Um, so you have this little bit of a computer in a car, um, and that controls how the engine operates or the motor operates for a given environmental condition. So the whole goal of this sort of, of, of this problem is to come up with a lookup table. So this basically, um, you give it what the current environmental conditions are, and I'll tell you how you should run your engine in the most efficient way. And the way that we learn these mappings is that we run lots of experiments on something like this. So I've never seen anything like this. I just sit in a, an office in Cambridge on my computer, but this is what they do in, a, for example, at Mazda, um, who are one of our clients. Um, so we say, okay, I want you to run the, the motor at a certain um, current for certain environmental conditions, and they'll go away and do it and tell us what the, the torque is. Um, so this is kind of the, the data acquisition strategy here. Um, so just a bit of a kind of a high level summary of some of the, the scale of this problem. Um, so we have typically six to 10 inputs. So these are things that we can control in the engine. Um, it's not just torque that we're interested in. We might be interested in some other things as well. Um, for example, emissions, it, that's probably more for the, the combustion engines. There's typically some constraints as well to make sure you don't blow up the engine. Um, and as I said, we're interested in finding some called a lookup table. So I'm going to make that very clear what that is in a couple of slides. Um, we also have a, a real problem in that our noise is heteroscedastic, which is a horrible word. And again, I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, the key thing is that these, the first three of these points are kind of directly tackleable. tackleable. You can tackle them with existing machine learning stuff. Um, the last two of these, they're kind of some papers out there. So if they kind of feel like they are solved problems, but in practice, they're not. Um, and actually, there are some aspects later on that there is kind of no existing approaches to solve. Um, so I just wanted to kind of paint a picture here of when you're solving these problems in industry, there's often somewhere you can start and some work that's relevant, but actually getting it to work, you typically have to do a lot of work. And so these are the subtle things about this problem that make it very tricky. Um, so the experiments themselves don't take a huge amount of time. 
um, but they do produce a huge amount of data. Um, there's also a notion of risk adversity, um, and there's a very large cost incurred by um, having to change the conditions of the engine. So I'm going to revisit all of these points again later on, um, but for now, let's focus on the first few. Um, but the, the kind of overall goal here is some sort of method that scales very well, uh, is that it's very quick, um, and also that it's robust. So this is something that's important when you're doing this stuff in, in industry, is that your algorithms are always working, um, which is kind of different to when you're writing a paper or doing research, which is where you just about need to get it to work once for a paper for your experimental results. Um, so that's something I've learned anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm going to focus on these two, these two bits for now. Um, and as I said, there's some sort of, we wanted to solve this problem. We found some papers that promised um, that they could solve it. So this latter one is, uh, yeah, one of Neil's. Um, but it turns out in practice, they're perhaps not exactly what we wanted. So I'm going to go through how we adapted these sort of ideas to get them to work for our problem. Um, and then I'm also going to go through some kind of exciting new bits of, of work um, that we did to, to solve these problems as well. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with a very quick recap of Bayesopt, and then I'm going to yeah, explain how we came up with a proof of concept. Um, so kind of the first steps for solving this problem, and then I'm going to explain how we kind of had some fun and developed some quite um, complicated algorithms uh, for this problem. Cool. So quick op uh, optimization recap. Um, so let's suppose we're trying to find some maximum of a function. Okay, so this is the function. It's pretty simple. Uh, but we want to find this maximum using kind of as few evaluations as, as possible. Um, so we're interested in finding the very best solution. We'd probably be reasonably happy if we got this kind of pretty good solution, uh, but it's certainly not adequate if all we find are one of these kind of rubbish uh, solutions on the edges here. Okay, so suppose we made five evaluations. Um, that's all we know at the moment, and we have to pick where to make the next evaluation. Um, so there's various kind of thought processes that are going on about where we should we should evaluate. And I'm sure Carl has gone through explore exploit trade-off, but maybe does anyone want to suggest where we should uh, evaluate next and why? Yes. Because there's that very large part from like 27 onwards where we know very little what's going on there. So that's a bit more of like explore interview where you have a lot of uncertainty and drop in the end from Yeah, yeah. And there's probably one other place I'd also try. Mm -hmm. Probably between the two highest points. Yes. As an exploit kind of area. Yeah, exactly. So this is quite clear cut in one, it's certainly in these one dimensional problems. We can kind of make these sort of arguments ourselves. Once we're in five, six dimensions, it becomes impossible um, to really think about it as a human. So we can leverage sort of machine learning to do that for us. Um, but yeah, what's, what's going on here is, yeah, we, we can fit some sort of statistical model. So a Gaussian process, which again, Carl Henrik, says he's, he's told you about, but I, I'm not going to kind of go into the details of this, but just assume you have some sort of model um, that has some sort of um, statistical output, so some uncertainty associated with it. Um, but this on the top here, it's kind of natural to plot these, these curves. So these are samples from that model. And that's kind of what's going on in our head when we're thinking about where should we next evaluate. Um, so as you said, on the right, we really don't know what's going on. So it's very possible that we could have a function um, that's, that's really good at that. Um, but that's, I, th I think that's, yeah. That's the thought process anyway. But as I said, yeah, and any sort of statistical model that has some sort of um, predictive distribution. So for a Gaussian process, uh, we have a, a Gaussian distribution. So we kind of have a rough idea of what's going on in the orange um, line, but we're very uncertain about it. Um, so the key thing for Bayesopt is you define something to, to uh, automate the arguments we were making before. So it's called an acquisition function. Um, and I'm going to just quickly go through one called expected improvement, which is, is probably one of the most simple, um, but there are a huge number of more complicated, perhaps less useful acquisition functions that you can come up with. That was basically what I did in my PhD. Um, but yeah, so let's suppose that we've found the best solution so far, which is this uh, horizontal dotted line. We can then see what, how much of an improvement we could expect to get by making an evaluation somewhere else. Um, so this is essentially just the expected value over all of these red um, double, double arrows. And that corresponds to this red line below. So this is the acquisition function. And as we described, it's, it's telling us to evaluate either somewhere in the middle or somewhere on the edge for those reasons. But I wouldn't worry too much about this. The key thing is that there's some sort of function that's telling us where it's reasonable to collect more data. 
Uh, and just to really hammer this home, I'm going to go through very quickly a, a whole day's up loop. Um, so I suppose this is the true function, and we've made these green evaluations. We fit a Gaussian process surrogate model. So in the blue here, the dark blue line is the posterior mean, and then there's some uncertainty in the light blue. And that corresponds to the acquisition function below, which has a maximum value at the vertical red line. Red line. So we evaluate there, update the model, calculate a new acquisition function, and just sort of crack on like that until eventually uh, we're pretty confident that we know where the, the minimum is. Oh, sorry, I've swapped from doing maximums to minimums here. Uh, yeah, sorry, but we're now minimizing a function. I should probably fix that. Uh, and you see that we've found the minimum, um, but in a very kind of data efficient way. So we've not wasted loads of resources exploring the whole space. Uh, so that's kind of the point of all of this. Uh, and we can look at something very similar in 2D. So I suppose we have this function, which is called the six hump camel function. So from here, it doesn't look like a six hump camel at all. But if you zoom in a little bit, maybe a little bit more six hump camely, I'm not sure. Uh, Bayesian optimization people like to call things stupid names. Um, but anyway, the point is there's no way of using a kind of a local optimizer uh, to solve this, this problem, really. You'll get stuck. And that's what I show here. Oh, none of my GIFs are working. Any, any idea? Uh, perhaps if I do it from. Yeah, I've, I've done it in a PDF. Um, let me just spend one moment. Uh, I'll just unplug my laptop so I'm going to my emails. Uh, it's worth it. There's a lot more gifts later on. That's the problem. Um, yeah. No, I have an intern at the moment that's basically just been making me tons of gifts, which has been uh, great. I don't know if any of you lot want to do internships, but. <laughs> No, this isn't going to work. It's all right. It doesn't matter. I think so, yeah. Um, I do, but the, I think the Wi Fi won't support me going onto my Google Drive. I just tried to do it, I didn't like it. It's fine. We'll be fine. Uh, anyway, right. Let's ignore all of that. We can move on. Uh, it's not hugely important. So I've kind of painted the picture. We've got a bit of basic optimization we want to do. Um, but now I'm going to show you how it, this motor calibration is actually a Bayesian optimization problem. And yeah, this is the first step of any sort of um, researcher's job in industry is that you typically you've got to hack together a few things that are already out there to try and solve the problem uh, kind of in the minimal uh, effort you can. So that's what's going to happen here. Um, so yeah, we have to try and use Neil's papers, basically. Um, so again, standard Bayesian optimization is all about trying to find the minimum of a function. Um, or maximum, I seem to be swapping between them willy nilly now. But on the left here, we've got kind of a true objective function in, in 2D. So this is the ground truth. And we're interested in finding the region where it's very, very dark. So that's what this red dot signifies here. Uh, on the right, we have a predictive distribution from our um, Gaussian process. Um, and actually, if we were just going to take what we think the minimum value is at the moment, it's all the way over here. So it's clear that we need to collect a bit more data to make our model better. Um, but to be able to kind of solve this problem, what you need is lots of data in that kind of optimal area of the space. What we're doing now for this problem for engine calibration is actually quite different. So this is something called profile Bayesian optimization. So as I said before, we're interested in learning a lookup table. Um, so this is, we're no longer interested in learning a single point. Um, we now need to find the, the location of the minimizers for a whole range of inputs. So typically we have what we call decision variables and context variables. So on the x-axis here, we have something called a context. And basically what we need to learn is what is the optimal decision for every context? So that corresponds to a curve. So the, the ground truth one, so this is the thing we're trying to learn is this red curve on the left here. But actually from the Gaussian process model we have at the moment, we're estimating that the profile is this black curve. So clearly this isn't great at the moment. Sure. In practice, when we're doing something like this, because certain contexts are way more prevalent than certain others, like this, which will be around 20 degrees and not around minus 20 degrees, won't we want to give like more weight to some of these? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. So, yeah, we typically, the metrics we often use, we have um, Mazda basically drive around the car for a bit, and then we can see how often certain contexts happen, and then that's how we kind of derive. 
and all of this. But uh, yeah, I'm talking about it here, just pretending everything is kind of equally important. But you're right, there's, there's trade-offs about like where we can learn. And obviously in that setting, it's worth learning more about the, the more frequent um, conditions. But yeah, it's a very good question. Um, but yeah, I'm ignoring that for now. Um, but yeah, so this is what we're trying to do. So this is a harder task than Bayesian optimization. Um, we're trying to learn this, this curve. And actually for us, so in this plot here, we have one decision dimension and one context dimension. So for us, we have two decisions. So this is the current and the phase angle of the current. Um, and we have three contexts. In reality, we have about five or six contexts, but for now, let's suppose we have three. So what we actually want to do is learn a mapping from a 3D space to a 2D space. Um, so yeah, there, there's something in the literature and there's like a special acquisition for this, um, but it's very complicated and very tedious. Um, so I'm not gonna bother talking about it now, but the point is, there is something out there, but it's not quite what we want. So it doesn't deal with some of the constraints that we need to take into account. Of. So we've had to do some sort of rejigging of it. Um, so that was kind of a bit of a, a bit of fun uh, research sort of stuff we had to do at the start. Um, but yeah, I won't go into that now. Okay, the other problem we have in this um, motor calibration uh, setting is that we have large amounts of data. So we're collecting a thousand data points each time we, we collect a data point. So it's kind of funny, we, we normally suggest like 10 data points and then Mazda's um, sensors go crazy and like, give us a thousand back. So we basically say, okay, we want you to evaluate these 10 things. And they basically just turn on the engine and just collect data all the way. Um, so we very quickly build up huge amounts of data. And um, so I don't know if, if you spoke about kind of the limitations of Gaussian processes at all, but basically there's this horrible cost of inverting the big, the big matrix when you calculate a Gaussian process. Um, so if N is the amount of data you have, you have this really, really expensive operation. And this means that once you, even if you have kind of more than a thousand, you start to get into a bit of trouble, but certainly 10,000, you'd have no chance of hitting a gas in process model. And that's the real issue for us. But actually a very active area of research um, is something called scalable uh, models, so sparse Gaussian processes. Um, and I'm probably gonna kind of murder this, um, but I'm gonna very, very quickly in one slide, try and give you a, at least a flavor for, for what's going on here. Uh, and the particular model we use is this thing called this, um, sparse variational Gaussian process. Um, but the key thing is that rather than trying to fit to all the data, so imagine here we've got all of these blue crosses, we could fit a Gaussian process to all of these and we get this blue uh, model in the background, the light blue, but we could equivalently, equivalently just uh, kind of pick some representative data points. So a small number, um, here I've got kind of 11 um, carefully closed, chosen data points, but if you fit a Gaussian process to those, you get a very similar looking model. So this isn't quite what's going on and there's a lot more subtlety to it. Um, but these original models for doing this scalable Gaussian process, it was all about picking a subset of your data that was representative of the rest of the data. And that was how you kind of got around the scaling issue. The more sophisticated approaches like this SVGP, um, they actually, you optimize and you can move around these red dots to kind of um, put them in the right place. And they don't necessarily have to match up the data points. Um, but there's no real need to go into any more detail than that. So basically you can fit something that looks a bit like a Gaussian process. Uh, to very large amounts of data if you want to. And we had to do this. Um, the other subtlety we have for our problems is that we have very heteroscedastic noise. Um, so here, what I've done is I've, I've generated some, some samples from a, a, a toy function. Um, but if you notice kind of the noise levels as you go along the x-axis here are very different in different areas of the space. Uh, and we need to be able to have a model that can support that. So a standard Gaussian process or sparse Gaussian process typically assumes that you have a fixed noise level. Um, so you end up having to fit models that look like this. But actually, um, one of my colleagues uh, did some work with, with Neil where they have this thing called a chained GP. Um, and this allows you to, to well model these, this heteroscedastic um, data. And the key thing here is that you actually have two Gaussian processes in play now. So we're having these, these noise observations are, are, are a Gaussian distribution around one um, Gaussian process that tells you kind of the, um, the structure and then you have another Gaussian process which is this G um, which allows you to kind of have very flexible noise model. Um, so this all looks great uh, and we were quite happy with this, um, certainly Alan was, um, but unfortunately it's very unstable this model um, and there's kind of two very key failure modes that you could have and um, so, as I said, we have these two different Gaussian processes that we have to fit at the same time, one explaining the signal, one explaining the noise. Um, and ideally, we want to get this thing on the top here. 
but it's very easy to kind of fall into one of these two settings where one of the Gaussian processes is all the heavy lifting and the other one basically gets switched off. Um, so either what's happening in the middle plot is basically we're saying everything is noise. So if you notice that the, there's a straight line in the middle, so this means that we're not really predicting any signal. We're just saying everything is noise and that's no use to us. And kind of the opposite on the bottom here. So basically we're saying everything is signal and we've just failed to really get a good handle on the noise. Um, it's also pretty expensive to fit these models, um, which, which is a problem. And if you think about how we actually use these models in base optimization, it looks like this. So we collect some initial data, we fit the Gaussian process model once, we collect more data, often many times, to get the final model. Um, so if, if you think about this, what we're doing is we have a model that's maybe fit well, we then collect some data in areas of the space where we don't have any data, or um, we collect more data that's very close to other data points we've already looked at that we think are good. And that's kind of like just a pretty surefire way to break a model. That's what we've decided. So it's almost kind of an adversarial robustness test. So if you want to, if you have a model and you want to test how robust it is, you should plug it into a Bayesian optimization loop. But basically, there's a whole ton of failure modes um, that you can get, and these models just kind of become garbage. Um, so we had to come up with some, um, so some bits and bobs. None of these really kind of that complicated, but took quite a lot of work to get them all to, to play nicely with each other. So yeah, so the, the kind of the story here is that the just because there's a paper about something doesn't necessarily mean that it's completely ready for, for all possible things that you might want to do with it. Um, so what I've discussed so far is that we have, yeah, a handful of existing algorithms we found. Uh, we sort of squished them together with some clever hacks um, and it's allowed us to, to provide this proof of concept um, solution for Mazda. Mm. How long have I been speaking for? Cool. Does anyone have any questions so far? Yes. So you said that the way that the data is being gathered, you're going to say, okay, there's this situation which I want to find out what's going on there. And then you fire that the engine, just essentially measuring what happens all the way through. So isn't it a bit problematic that many of these measurements are done in a very transient mode where you aren't now like, okay, I'm at this position of the engine and with these variables for a good 10 seconds, but I want to very quickly pass in through this. Yeah, that's, that's a really excellent question. So that's a subtlety I haven't bothered talking about. Um, that's kind of the most complicated part of this whole problem is that I'm going to touch on it a little bit in a moment, but the, the faster we move around kind of the, the search space in this problem, the less accurate our data is because you have this transience. So you really need to kind of slowly move somewhere across the search space, or you need to move quickly and wait a long time there to collect the quality data. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of a really nasty aspect of the problem that I couldn't really work out a way to explain kind of quickly. Um, so yeah, I've not touched on that either. You're asking very good questions. <laughs> Anybody else? So the Chapman that also is something for data is many data points between uh, point A and point B. Um, it's Chapman's run that so that run everything is basically correlated in some way. It's you don't have truly independent samples. So if, um, yeah. Only reproduce cross yeah, and that's also a very, very good point that we didn't really realize. This is in a previous project. So for this one, it's kind of okay, but we did some work on um internal combustion engine calibration basically to try and keep emissions down and the way their test bench works is that we maybe say yeah make a load of evaluations along this path and then if it was like if the engine looked like it was about to blow up the engineers would stop which is good uh, and actually that was one of the biggest savings we gave them is that they blew up like half as many engines once they started using yeah. that stuff um the actual improved speed i don't think was that important um but basically that that was very correlated to the path you took so you could do a slightly different path and it would you wouldn't get the engine blowing up in the same place so it was very hard for us to like model that sort of where the engine is blowing up uh, and we had to take this like correlated samples into account to do that in the end um yeah another great question cool right i'll crack on a little bit um so we've now got some kind of slightly more funky ideas that we had to develop um, kind of from scratch um, to solve just the, the few remaining aspects of this problem, um, although not the, the aspect you, you described. Um, so yeah, as I said, there's this red box here that have these kind of three key properties um, that we, of the problem that we need to solve. Um, so I'm gonna start with the first one of these, um, which is that there's a very large cost incurred by changing the engine settings. So we said that, before that, yeah, if you move very slowly, you get better quality data. Um, so that's kind of the principle that we use. We kind of keep moving slowly if we can. But that means that, yeah, if we want to kind of 
try the engine at one uh, voltage and then we try it at a very different voltage. Some engineer has to go into the thing and fiddle some knobs or whatever um, and actually incurs a large cost, which is almost comparable to the cost of making the evaluations themselves. So to kind of keep the whole cost of doing the calibration down, we need to somehow encourage the basic optimization to be smooth. Oh, this was this was the key gift, to be honest. Um, but we'll be fine. I can skip this. But yeah, there were some very very nice gifts there. Mm -hmm. um, but let's 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 suppose we're just doing standard basic optimization. And um, so here I've got a couple of functions, and this is kind of the distribution of points you get from doing base opt often. Um, but of course, the way that this would work is that maybe you'd evaluate something in the bottom right corner, then you go up to the top left, then you go to the top right, then you go in the middle, then you go back down here. So you're just jumping all over the spot. Um, and yeah, as I said, that's very expensive if you've got to keep sending someone in to recalibrate it all the time. Um, but it also kind of winds them up. Um, like if they were going to use some sort of other optimizer and they found good solutions, they'd expect to kind of hone in on them. But instead, they were being told to go and go some area that they themselves know is bad. So we had a lot of kind of pushback from the actual engineers um, for this problem as well. Um, so what we've done, um, this is kind of work in progress with, with, with an intern, um, but we've kind of, uh, we're using some kind of slightly more, uh, um, I guess, I don't know what the right, right word is, I guess sexy machine learning bits, like something like an LSTM perhaps. I don't know if any, any of you know this, some sort of funky neural network stuff um, to try and circumnavigate um, some of the, um, these problems. So this is the, the paths that result from, from the sort of algorithm that we're using here. Um, so you see that we are exploring kind of, certainly on the right here, we are doing reasonably good of exploring the whole space, um, but we are able to kind of focus in on, on one area. So you the question, so, so now because it's a dynamic goal, it's a sequence optimization problem. Yeah. So now you're even more committed to the initial design. Yes, so there's no GPs involved in this. Okay. Um, so we don't need like a big initial design. So we can start from one point. Yeah. Um, but you're right, D depending where that is, you can have quite different performances. We decided just starting in a corner seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Uh, and this sort of spiraling motion was sort of learned by the LSTM, but it, it kind of makes sense. We thought it was a bug to start with, um, but actually that's kind of what you would do. You kind of kind of explore as much of the space and then hone in on a point. The key thing here is that you have to be very non-myopic, which is what my uh, gifts were going to show. Um, yeah, maybe if I've got time at the end, I'll come back to this. Um, but there's there's a real subtlety here in terms of um, if you imagine that um, we've made an evaluation in the bottom corner of the space, and when we, we say, okay, we want to pick the next point to be very close but have high expected improvement. Um, this means that it's very hard for you to kind of make some bad decisions in, an, in order to make some good decisions later on. So if you imagine that we're, if we were stuck here and we want to go to here eventually, if all we're looking at is kind of local, we're allowed to go locally here, pick the point with the most improvement, we would never actually make an evaluation in the middle, which means we'd never make our way all the way across. Um, so you have to do some quite different methodology to get these algorithms to work. And in the Gaussian process case, it becomes very intractable very quickly. Um, so we have kind of this hacky uh, neural network approach instead. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll get back to the GIFs. Um, there's also another subtlety. So when you use these um, sparse Gaussian processes, as I said, there are these things called inducing points, or maybe I didn't call them that, um, but they're the representative data points that you pick to try and summarize what's going on. And um, so imagine on the top here, um, we've got some green, green, green crosses of data points, and I'm trying to approximate that fit using just four data points. So they're the red, the red dots, the four inducing points. So using a standard, what we call an inducing point allocation, so IPA, um, you typically spread these inducing points very, very far apart. But you see the actual resulting model sucks. So in the background, this dotted line is the, the function we're trying to minimize. And actually, if we put these inducing points to be very far apart from each other to kind of cover the whole function, that model is really not very useful for trying to find the minimum value. So we had to instead develop some kind of specific ways to allocate these inducing points within Bayesian optimization loops. Um, so if you see here, we're able to kind of focus the, the points into areas of the space where there are, we think there are good solutions. And that allows our model to update appropriately. You can see exactly the same thing here. There's quite a lot to unpack in this, in this plot. Um, let's start on the left. So what I've done on the top row, there's, that's an objective function that we're trying to minimize. So we're trying to basically find the minimum, which is inside that square. Uh, the green dots are data points, and what I do is I fit a Gaussian process to those data points and calculate the acquisition function, which I've plotted below. 
So the EI expected improvement acquisition function is telling us that we definitely should make some evaluations around. So on the right, all of these other plots, I've done a sparse Gaussian process model. So instead of using these green um, data points, I'm trying to represent them using a, just 25 red inducing points. And you see that these two columns in the middle, they're kind of existing approaches for putting these points out. Uh, and, and, and they're meant to kind of give you a good coverage of the whole space. But actually, the acquisition functions you get from those sparse models are entirely unsuitable. They're not kind of helping us get really precise optimization. Um, whereas if we use something more clever, so we still have a good coverage of the space with our juicing points, but we kind of focus them a bit more locally, we're able to still do Bayesian optimization. Uh, and there's a very similar setting here as well for, so this is an active learning problem, very toy active learning problem. Um, on the left here, I have, um, uh, this is um, the incidence of malaria in Nigeria. Um, basically, if, if it's yellow, it means the, the malaria rate is lower than a certain threshold. If it's purple, it's above. Uh, and the idea is we were trying to like learn where this boundary is. Um, and again, if we just put these points kind of spread them uniformly across the space or, or even in a clever space filling way, which is what I've done here, the resulting predictions from the model. So in the middle here, the purple and the yellow are just kind of rubbish. Um, but if instead we kind of put them in clever places um, we're able to have really accurate models that are kind of suitable for the task at hand. So this is an active learning task. So this is the final bit, um, but this is quite important. So this is something we got pushed back from Mazda a lot about. Um, they're very interested in kind of risk adversity. So let's suppose that we have two things we could do. Okay, we could do the blue thing or the red thing. And here, this is the distribution of the emissions that re would result from doing those two things. Um, so the red one um, has a lower mean than the blue one. So on average, the emissions are lower by doing the red thing than doing the blue thing. Okay, so it, oh, sorry. I've got this the wrong way around, haven't I? Yeah. Um, let's ignore emissions. Imagine it's, um... oh no, sorry, I'm right. So I confused myself. So yeah, it's emissions. So the, the red has a lower average emission, um, whereas the blue um, has these very heavy tails. So it's possible that you could get very, very high emissions from that decision. Um, so it's not kind of suitable to just think about the mean. Uh, you also want to think about the whole kind of possible decisions that could happen, the outcomes that could happen for making this decision. Um, so it's no longer sufficient just to say, okay, we're going to give you this solution because we think that on average it will give you low emissions. We have to say, okay, we're going to give you this solution because we think that 95% of the time it's going to give you very low emissions. Um, so it's kind of a different way of thinking about things. Um, and actually a lot of the, the existing base optimization methods don't, uh, don't allow you to do this. And we actually had to come up with some very different models. Um, and this is, this is a plot, which I, thought, I think is nice, but very kind of difficult to understand. Um, but let's suppose that we have all of these black dots here are, are, are evaluations and their measurements. Uh, and what we want to do is learn the quantile. So normally when we're plotting a Gaussian process and um, we're trying to learn the mean, but here we're trying to learn the quantile, right? So this is the kind of the point at which um, in this case, 90% of the data lies below. So that would be good to correspond to this red line here. Um, so we had to build some, some funky Gaussian process that models quantiles directly, um, which gives us a sort of green curve here. Um, and then I've plotted lots of samples from that function in the yellow here as well. So you can see that um, we're able to use these samples and they can sort of drive the basic optimization um, if you wanted to. Cool, I think that's all I've got. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. So both of our countries are left to touch on some very interesting things here. Where some of the time the world is interested in is when we, I don't know, playing around with Gaussian processes in the classroom or with some, some toy setting, then, and even more generally, we can always know if we that, we're just, you know, taking a bunch of samples from the function and saying, okay, then did we match up? Did we not match up? And so this is one of those very much so real world settings where how do you know actually that they're correct and that the solution really gets the job done properly? Because I know maybe like you look at a few different settings or they just say something differently, especially when you reach like even six dimensions, uh, things can be much better. So kind of broadly here, how do you test yourself? Yeah, so it's, that's a, another really good question. So it's slightly more subtle in this, in the kind of Bayesian optimization setting, but we, we do two things. So at the very start of this sort of work, 
we would fit just the sort of models that we're talking about using here, we would fit those on a larger data set that someone has given us from the real engine, basically. They'll just go and collect a, a ton of data. Mm -hmm. and we'll just see how well our models model that. And we can sort of give them back, that back to them and we can say, look, our models do this, this and this, that's fine. Um, so you typically need something kind of offline to do that. You need, you need this larger data set. Um, so that's how we did that. But there's another subtlety here in that the output for our procedure is like an optimal thing. Um, they don't know what the optimal thing is. We don't know what the optimal thing is, but the actual optimal thing is. We think we've found a good estimate of it. Um, so it's very hard to kind of present this to them in a way that, you know, they're like, oh yeah, this is, they found the right thing. Um, they might use what they, we, typically what we do is compare against their existing approaches, but they're not that difficult to beat um, often. But it's still, we still don't know if like, have we found, like back to the plot right at the start, like, uh, Oh, I went too quick. <laughs> like, which one of these have we found? Like, we don't really know. If you if you don't know what this function is, you've got uh, the model that we've learned from the data we've collected. You don't know. Um, so we're hoping we're in one of the two in the middle, but maybe we're not. Um, and cool. but you can tend to you, whenever we produce a solution from this sort of algorithm, it goes to the engineers at the company that we're working with. They sort of prod it, try and work out if it's robust, various things like that. Um, and we're trying to encode more and more of that into the, the pipeline itself. Um, so yeah. Uh, can we give some more details on the LSTM solution? Oh, are you still using yeah. the process? To... I need to get the GIF. I think that's the only way we're going to understand what's going on. Uh, I'm just keen to hear what the application is sort of the Yeah, so it's kind of free of all of that sort of stuff, um, which is nice. But uh, but it's nice and it's also horrible. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a, a Gaussian process is involved. Here we go. This is what this is what I should have started with. I think. All right, we should be GIF and galore now. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we should emulate your signs. <laughs> Use with the Gaussian process. <laughs> <laughs> or an LSTM. Sorry, sure. Uh, variational auto-gas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, can I take your question for the well, map? Wait, just a quick question. So what is your stopping function for your team? Like what at what point do you say, you know, I really think I, you know, sample where I think the optimum is gonna be, but you know, maybe I could keep sampling really try to get precise. I mean, because there's a cost, obviously, to yeah. your customer. Um, so how do you balance that kind of trade-off? So that's also a really interesting point in base up, is that there is no real way to know when you should stop. The correct way to do it is to like, you know, maybe maybe Mazda will tell us, oh, this is how much it costs if we blow up an engine. This is how much it costs to keep running the test bench. This is how much we would save if we eke out an extra 1% or whatever. Yeah. They don't tell us any of that and they won't. Um, so really what we do is we kind of, we just keep going until things get quite stable. Yeah. Um, that's the best we can do. We do have numbers from them in terms of, or if, if you improve performance by this amount, we don't care. So basically if we can kind of get to a point where we're not getting seeing those improvements, we can stop. Um, what we actually do is very lazy and we just delegate all of this to them. So they have like a basically um, sort of an interface with our system. So they say, oh, we've collected this data that you asked us to, here you go. We do our stuff and it comes back and then they and, and we return to them what we think the solution is at the moment and they keep looking at that until they're happy with it i hope it doesn't do this for every slide no okay oh i'm sorry we're gonna oh, oh. 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 i don't know oh. i don't know if everyone now understands everything that came after this yeah, slide oh, yeah. it's pretty yeah i didn't do a very good job of this to be honest so yeah i feel like it's got far more focus than it deserves now that wasn't like it. No, that was me. Yeah. yeah that, so that's not actually a GIF. That's some PowerPoint magic. Oh. Old school. Uh, yeah, the GIF. Sorry, there's so many slides. Oh, this was a GIF. We might as well look at this. I made it. I made this one myself. So on the left, we've got some sort of basic optimization -y thing. Uh, and on the right, this is what would happen if you use something, some sort of gradient optimizer. So we just go straight off into the wrong bit. Whereas here we're kind of exploring the whole space but it is nice to look at this for a moment if it runs again 
Lucy, can I go again? No. No, okay. Oh, well. Uh, we go to, aha, Bryce. Okay, so I'm, I think I can only run it the once because I need to go through them. But here we're going to do, so we've got, oh, oh, there we go, all right. So this is a gift done by my intern, so it seems to keep doing it itself, so much of much higher quality than the ones I made. Um, but yeah, so on the left here, we've got kind of Bezop doing its thing. You're jumping around the space as much as you want. Um, in the middle, I'm kind of showing the, the best solution we found so far. So this goes down over time, which is great. So we want, to get, we want that to get as low as possible as quickly as we can. That means we've found the minimum quickly. What I'm plotting on the right here is the distance, so the L1 distance, so the, the distance in terms of the X plus the distance in terms of the Y um, between all of these red dots as we go on. So you see that you very quickly incur quite a large cost. And, and the point of this is that, yeah, this corresponds to the large cost of having to move the engine around, like recalibrate it for various settings. So ideally we wanna get a plot in the middle that goes down very quickly, as well as a plot on the right that goes up very slowly. Um, so one thing you could do, is to do the same approach that you would normally, but you only allow yourself to pick a point that's very close to the point that you're currently at. So that minimizes the amount of moving around you do. But if you see what happens, we kind of go down, we end up in the bottom right corner. We really, we want to be trying the points up in the top left, but there's no way of us getting there. Because if we're saying, okay, the next point is going to give us, we're only picking points that are going to give us a big improvement on that step, then we can't really hop out of that hole that we've dug ourselves on the bottom right. So we need to be saying, okay, we're willing to not make, see improvements in the next 10 steps in order that we can get a really big payoff in the top left. And um, so that's what I, I'm saying here is non-myopic. So, non, so myopic means that you only care about what you're doing on the next step. Um, and that's what standard based optimization is. But if you can kind of tweak it, so use something called binoculars. I don't know if you were all involved in that, Neil. Oh yeah, glasses is, yeah. Glasses sucks. Uh, binoculars is a bit better, but still, even binoculars is also kind of rubbish. It doesn't scale very well. Uh, but the point here is that you're able to say, I'm willing to take a bit of a hit on the next couple of steps. Um, this is kind of a tweaked version of binoculars that takes into account costs of moving around. Um, but this was, again, a kind of a proof of concept that didn't really work. Um, so yeah, we did, we did the whole um, NSTM thing instead. So the way this worked, back to your question. Sorry, this has been a long, a long, a long road to get to that. Um, so what we do is that we have some sort of LSTM that takes in um, all of the previous data points that we've evaluated and their responses. Given those, it just spurts out the next X location to go for, okay? Um, and the way we train it is that we sample a ton um, of samples from a Gaussian process. So the point of the Gaussian process, we like it because we can say, okay, we think our function is smooth. Um, this model is gonna do a good job of that. So what we can instead do is just sample loads of functions from a Gaussian process. So they're lots of kind of smooth functions that we think are going to be kind of like the ones we're going to try and optimize. And then we can just evaluate the performance of that LSTM on all of those functions. And then if you, if you kind of set it up in the right way, you can kind of back propagate through, back propagate through time, which sounds cool, um, but I don't think it is. Um, and you can train some sort of, um, yeah, an LSTM that, that will say, okay, suppose I've seen these points here, it will then say you should evaluate it here. And the reason why it kind of does these smooth paths is because our loss function isn't just the kind of how good a point do we find, but it's how good a point do we find given a cost budget. So it's very easy in the objective here to add in some sort of like notion of how expensive moving around is, basically. Can you backtrack that as well to figure out, you know, you don't want to have multiple starting points that end up in the same place, right? Because that's the danger in this case, right? So can you backtrack that of saying, you know, you would effectively have, um, I ended up in this place, what starting point did I take to explore more of the space? Yeah, so we didn't, we did try like basically optimizing the first point, like the location of the initial point. Yeah. Um, and it seemed broadly happy that could kind of be anywhere and you broadly see the sort of same behaviors. It would kind of learn to account for that. It, it didn't seem like it was getting, maybe it was an issue with the way we set it up, but it was never really getting much signal all the way back there. Um, but yeah, I think I should stop. I've gone on for too long. Does anyone have a final question? No. Yeah, we have a
so, so this is basically it then. So, so yeah, this is kind of the end of the course. Uh, so we thought, well, for us at least. <laughs> but so now the proposals is the main thing. So send that link around, hopefully to everyone. I had to cut out lots of emails from Moodle. <laughs>